think we're live. There's usually a delay. We shall see. <laughs> this is always the most interesting part of the live stream, is when uh, you know the live streamer doesn't know if they're live or not because there's a latency and delay in the stream. Um, it looks like we're good. Uh, should be able to hear me. Yep. All right. So news and updates. So this is what I always do every every episode: news and updates. Um, so I recorded, pre-recorded an episode because I will not be able to do a live stream next Thursday. So unfortunately for all of you guys, you'll have to deal with a, I will still upload a video at 11 a.m. Thursday, Eastern Standard Time, but it will not be a live recording of a video. So you got that to look forward to. Sorry, I, I'm amped up this morning. I just pounded down, you know, a whole mug of, um, Irish breakfast tea right before doing this and I did a lot of research in preparation for today's episode and I got a lot of things to say um, but yeah so I pre-recorded an episode it's an episode with a guest host uh, so that'll be fun you'll get to actually have someone else on this episode of the podcast or at least next week's episode I should say and other other updates um yeah youtube live is going well and we're still chugging along we've got like the next three episodes slated like you know planned out um hopefully there'll be interesting episodes nonetheless but uh that's the basic updates i've got for this week's episodes so pre-recorded for next week got the next three or four episodes slated so um Stay tuned for those. There's going to be one talking about coffee table books and what the heck a coffee table book is. So that'll be that'll be interesting. Um, and yeah, I don't really have any big updates other than those because the big updates happened last week and the week before, I think, when we made the transition to YouTube Live. But other than that, I think we're going to get jumping into this week's episode because um, usually, I mean, if you watch it live or you watch the YouTube video after the fact then you don't realize that the news and updates section that I do here, like the first few minutes, just to sort of, you know, clear the air and get comfortable with the, the live stream going live, this does not make it into the edited version that you can go listen to on Spotify. So this is sort of a live stream exclusive, you could say. Um, plus, you don't get the fun uh, intro theme song or like the editing and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, there are tradebacks or trade, <laughs> there are tradebacks, there are trade offs between the two. So if I seem a little jittery this morning, it's because I just pounded down an entire cup of tea, black tea, and I am ready to go. <laughs> and I'm amped up for today's book as well. So with that being said, let's get going with the script. So if I look away, it's because I'm looking at a script. Don't worry, I only read a script for a very brief segment of it because at this point I still haven't memorized my intro yet and it still gets tweaked from time to time. So whew, composure, because when I do it on live stream, I can't do retakes, so it all just gets stuck in the live stream. So uh, here we go. Hey there, bibliophiles. Welcome to From the Archives, a book review podcast where I talk about a book from my library and whether you should or shouldn't read it. I'm Eric, a professor of anthropology at Cuyahoga Community College, and welcome to my library. The books in my library are sometimes old, sometimes rare, sometimes normal, but always interesting. This podcast is recorded live every Thursday on YouTube at Anthropology Archives uh, at 11 a.m. Eastern. Every episode, I ask myself the following questions. Who wrote it? What's it about? What are other people saying about it? Should you read it? And whether I should can it or keep it? Uh, some other fun catchphrases are chuck it or cherish it, reread or recycle, shelve it or shove it. Uh, point is, should you keep it on your shelf? Should you go out and buy it? Uh, and if you already have a copy, should you just throw it in the garbage? Uh, with all of that intro out of the way, let's pull a book from the shelf. So I actually didn't have to pull a book from the shelf for this one because I did a lot of research in preparation for this in advance of this episode, just because I have a lot of things to say about this week's book. Um, you know, I had my, my big old cup of Irish tea, so I'm wired and ready to go. This week's book I'm going to give it a thud on the desk so you can hear it. Oh, gosh. Sorry, headphone users. Uh, 
it's a thick boy. It's a, uh, I mean, this book has got to be at least, you know, an inch and a half thick, and it's like 600 pages. It is. Oh, here I also have to give you that ASMR book sound. It is La Vida. A Puerto Rican Family in the Culture of Poverty, San Juan and New York by Oscar Lewis, written in 1966, published by Random House Publishers. Uh, so there's a lot to unpack with this book. And the reason I have a lot to say about this book is because I actually teach um, Introduction to Cultural Anthropology. And so I pulled out, in addition to La Vida, I pulled out my textbook that I use in class. So right now, as of this recording, we're using Cultural Anthropology, a Toolkit for the Global Age, third edition by Ken Guest. And so this is the book that I use in my class. And Oscar Lewis actually is featured in um, this textbook, and maybe not in a great way. So we'll, we'll get into the book in a moment. Um, but I just thought I'd start here where it talks about the culture of poverty. So it, part of the subtitle of the book that we're talking about today. So um, the textbook basically says the culture of poverty is the theories of poverty of, as pathology trace ongoing poverty to the personal failings of the individual family or community. Anthropologist Oscar Lewis called this a, quote, culture of poverty. His research in Mexico, Puerto Rico, and the United States suggests that certain ways of thinking and feeling lead to the perpetual... Pe oh, gosh, that was probably super loud. Oh, my gosh, I'm going to have to edit that out of the uh, podcast version or the um, Spotify version or whatever you want to call it, wherever you get your podcast. I'm not paid for by Spotify here by any means. Um, but yeah, he's featured in the textbook sort of in this perception of class and class construction and the idea of a culture of poverty. So this is really his baby. His idea is the culture of poverty. Here, I'll put the little, I mean, the book is not really anything to write home about and on cover wise. It's just a hardcover book, um, red canvas, hardcover. There's nothing, nothing fancy, no frills about it. Um, but 1959 is when he when he publishes his first ethnography about um, a, a community in Mexico, rural Mexico, and then he does um, ethnography in Puerto Rico and New York of, of you know a family, the Rios family, which all of the names he uses are um, pseudonyms and they're not real names. He makes them up. He changes the names of uh, streetcar stops, the name of the community, although. I was able to figure out La Esmeralda is a made-up neighborhood, but it's uh, La Perla in uh, San Juan, which is just beyond uh, the Castile or the Citadel in uh, Old San Juan. But essentially, he's interviewing, and uh, he, I should specify, he's not actually doing the interviewing with this one. Um, Oscar Lewis is writing about this family, the Rios family, where they have ties to family in New York, but also in this uh, slum of San Juan. So before I start talking about that, I need to back up and tell you a little bit about Oscar Lewis. So this was his heyday. The 1960s was his heyday. He um, really came into being in the early 1960s. This is when Lyndon B. Johnson and the Great Society, the war on poverty uh, is happening. All of this legislation is being pushed through to you know improve condition quality of life and conditions for people who are poor and there's this perception that being poor is uh, inheritable that, and this is part of the culture of poverty and why i take issue with it um because it and i've got all these notes here on it i mean basically it's this idea of uh, instead of viewing poverty uh as the cause of single motherhood culture of poverty would have you argue that being a single mother leads to poverty. So it pretty much kind of flips on its head the idea of, of the cause and effect of poverty. And so it's, it's treating it as if, you know, poverty and the way people think in poverty, you know, you've probably heard this on Fox News or anywhere you see conservative media. The culture of poverty is very much, you know, created out of this idea of the poor did this to themselves, blame the victim ideology. Um, you know, the pathology of poverty. Um, it's not a very engaged perspective of anthropology. So just from a theoretical standpoint, I highly disagree with the culture of poverty concept. But I didn't know that going into this book. I literally did not put two and two together when I started reading this. Um, I just thought, oh, it's an ethnography of Puerto Rico and New York. So it's going to tell me a little bit about this early um, period in history. But what's frustrating about this is that Oscar Lewis... So he got his um, PhD from, I believe, Columbia. I don't have it in front of me. Um, but his 
earlier research involved basically library research of um, some tribes in the northwest coast so he couldn't actually go and interview them so that was problematic cultural anthropologists doing ethnography without actually directly interacting with people and then he repeats it again in this book which really leaves me wondering whether or not oscar lewis actually ever spoke with people or if he just kind of synthesized secondhand accounts from people who actually were in the field so he starts off the book um in describing his methodology and he's describing his um uh like the history of of puerto rico where he kind of glosses over some of the policies that the united states government enacted to try and develop puerto rico in the 1940s which ended up sort of damaging the agricultural economy so a lot of people who worked in agriculture were trying to be put into say factory work and it didn't really work out well and so it led to a mass migration of people in the 40s and 50s and 60s um so if you you know familiar with west side story at all like this is peak era of puerto rican immigration to the united states um and so obviously la vida is you know five written five years after the um Hollywood rendition of West Side Story and West Side Story, I think, originally came out in 1957 on Broadway. So, you know, this is around the same time as West Side Story, if you're familiar with that at all. Um, but he, he starts in the acknowledgments. And this is the part that gets me is this is all this is all a certain person gets. I am grateful to my students, Douglas Butterworth and Rosita Gonzalez for their assistance in all phases of the research project, but especially for their help with the field work in the slums of San Juan and New, in New York City. But you know reading this book it's rosita her name is is a um shortened or nicknamed rosa rosa does all of the field work her name appears in this way more than anyone else and in fact she's the one who actually visits the rios family in san juan she spends days and weeks um, in their homes she's the one who's actually gathering data observing things and then reporting it back to oscar lewis and then oscar lewis is synthesizing that into this book so that's problem number one I had, um, and uh, in order to correct that error, I ended up writing on this book, um, La Vida by Oscar Lewis and Rosita Gonzalez, because this book would not be possible at all without her work. She did not get any credit other than that one sentence, and that's, that's an astronomical dropping of the ball. Um, and one of the main reasons I took issue with this book is because it, it left me wondering where Oscar Lewis is getting his data. Um, how is he, tra is, is Rosita providing her translation of it or is she providing Spanish raw transcripts and then Oscar Lewis, it was unclear to me if Oscar Lewis spoke Spanish. I, I would assume so since he also did field work in Mexico, but it, it just left me with a lot of questions about the validity of the data collection in this book. Um, because Oscar Lewis was not in San Juan and he was not in New York, as far as I could tell, interacting with the people that he's writing about. The other issue I took with it, uh, was, um, oh, I mean, I, I suppose at this point, maybe I should just jump ahead while I'm, I'm discussing it and all the issues I have with this book. To be clear, I'd probably give this book a two out of five. Um, I know I'm not going in order here, but I got some things to say about this book. Um, I can't, I can't in good conscience give it a one out of five because as I said, it appears in, in intro to anthropo anthropology textbooks. And I did find like the first hundred pages, like Fernanda, what a character she is. I mean, I was hooked on her story. Like she, she's the, the way the book is divided up and the way it's written about the first 60 pages or so is, um, you know, the methodology, um, theory, all that kind of dry sort of anthropological stuff. Although I found it kind of interesting to read about Oscar Lewis's perspective, even though I disagree wholeheartedly with the culture of poverty concept, um, it was interesting to read it nonetheless. So that stuff was kind of useful, I would say, from an anthropologist's perspective. And then Fernanda's story I found very compelling, but um, the way, I'm sorry, I keep bouncing around here. The way it's written is it splits it up into Fernanda, the mom, and then all of her children. And so you basically get a slice of life of each of the um, children of Fernanda and Fernanda's life. So each chapter is usually a chapter about a day in the life of Fernanda or a day in the life of one of Fernanda's ex-husbands or one of her former lovers or one of her aunts. So like there's a bunch of characters you could say. And, and, I, and I call them characters because 
I was left wondering while reading this book, how much of this has been edited and selectively like curated. It, it, it definitely didn't leave me feeling, it, it felt almost like fiction. And as other people have reviewed this, um, saying the same thing, especially in its time when it came out in the 60s, it reads relatively easy in the beginning because it's written in sort of this fiction style where it's just their own words. Although as an anthropologist, I was left wondering, well, how much of this is translator bias? Who's the translator? Is it Rosita Gonzalez? Is it Oscar Lewis? Um, what are they leaving out in these narratives? Because there would be you know, large gaps of time that they wouldn't talk about, or they'd focus in on particular details and leave out others. And so it just left me wondering how much of this is an accurate reflection of what happened that day, um, and how much of this is being slightly tweaked by the anthropologist. Now, I'm not saying that they're, they're making everything up, but minor differences over the course of 600 pages can really like drastically change, I think, in the aggregate, the tone and the writing style of the book. And just being honest here, getting 300 pages into it, it just it wore down on me real fast. Fernanda was interesting, and I think if this were a 200-page book, I'd probably give it more higher rating, I guess, in that regard, but only because it would more concisely communicate information. But still, at the end of the day, it, it just sort of treats their words as if it's their own and not like a curated like narrative. Um, it, it definitely gives a perception of authenticity in a way that can distort reality. Um, it, there's no discussion of if Rosita ever was asked for to borrow money. Um, I mean, I think there's like one mention that I can recall in 600 pages where Rosita or Rosa is what she usually goes by, where she gives like a dollar to one of um, one of the grandkids of Fernanda to go like get ice cream or something like that. But there's no like mention of Rosa's perception. It's it's just sort of like a here's what they said and what they did, and we're gonna give a hands off, pretend to be unbiased because the 1960s is when there's this big movement of like you know science will solve all problems. Science is unbiased. There's no bias whatsoever in this, and so it's very matter of fact. Um, this is just the way they are. And I think there's a real danger in that. And the danger is the sort of culture of poverty mentality that has sort of morphed in the last 50 years into, well, you know, it's their own fault because they are lazy or they choose these things because that's just the culture of poverty. And I think the danger in that is if you are someone who already thinks that being poor is your own fault, then this is just going to reinforce your own beliefs about that because it does nothing to contextualize um, the behaviors of the people that are in this, the Brios family. It does nothing to discuss like alternative hypotheses or um, give other context to what's going on. It's just sort of like, a well, we're just presenting you the slice of life, daily life here. This is what they're like. Um, and, and it doesn't, it, it just... It leaves me feeling like it's a false sense of authenticity um, that's not addressed. Like there's no reflexivity, I would say. There's no polyvocality or maybe not polyvocality, but definitely there's no reflection on, you know, the influence of the ethnographer or the bias that they might have in translating, you know, from Spanish to English or, you know, Oscar Lewis being um, a Jewish born New Yorker. Uh, you know, interpreting what someone from Puerto Rico is saying about welfare or um, which he says they, they call el welfare, part of Puerto Rican Spanish. Um, yeah, it just gives this, it, it rubbed me the wrong way in the sense of it felt like false ethnography. So as far as ethnogra ethnographies go, I would definitely say Fernanda's, like it, it was an interesting enough style that in the beginning I was really interested in it. But it just wore me down over each chapter, and I just dreaded reading it because it's like there's nothing happy going on. It's just pessimistic, abysmal, bleak, um, nothing happy. So la vida, for context, is what is a euphemism for the life of a prostitute. So I'm living the life is a euphemism in you know Puerto Rico for... I'm a prostitute. And so really it's the ethnography of a prostitute family. So Fernanda's a prostitute, her children, Cruz, 
uh, Felicita or Fel Felicita and uh, Soledad, uh, all of them have been prostitutes at, at, at one point in their lives. And <clears throat> yeah, it's just, <sighs> I feel like it will definitely give people a false sense of what Puerto Rico was like because it's just the slums. And because of that, I just, I just had so many issues with this ethnography because it just, it was bad methodology all around. It was bad methodology, the culture of poverty. It was disingenuous at best in its presentation of data uh, because it makes no discussion, like I said, of, you know, Rosa's influence. Um, you know, what, how much is Rosa involved? I, all, for all I know, Rosa just simply tape recorded everything. They didn't even tell me if it was tape recordings or if it was just Rosa writing notes or, or whatnot. Um, so I have no way of knowing, you know, how, you know, the dialogue in this book plays out. Um, so it just left me with a lot of issues. And like I said, it appears in our intro to anthropology textbook. And basically the, the gist of what Ken Guest says is, yeah, it's a problematic view of, of poverty. And most anthropologists don't, don't line up with it today. So that's the context in our intro to, to anthropology textbook. And I guess to close out my big critiques of it, and if it seems like I'm just, you know, flying through this, it's because, like I said, I had a big old cup of tea and I have things to say with this book. Um, but I guess to close it out, it, it also, it just very much feels like an old anthro anthropological text because it's not engaged, it's not applied. And I think a lot of anthropologists today in you know the 21st century very much are working in an applied standpoint of like not once did was there discussion of like well can we present alternatives or solutions to you know the culture of poverty there was not any attempt in this to really say like what are some solutions what can we do what are the issues there was no questioning of what the issues are it was sort of just matter of factly like well just kind of be a fly on the wall rosa and just let them talk and not really asking questions and if there were interviews, I don't know what the interview questions were because they weren't presented. So it was just very much, it made it felt, it felt like a just so story to use uh, Rudyard Kipling. Um, it, it didn't feel like there was any sort of research design that would elicit these specific responses. And because of that, it made it feel sort of like, oh, well, this is organic. And this is, this is definitely just how poverty is. And this, this applies to everyone. And because of that, I just can't, I can't in good conscience give this anything higher than a two. I still gave it a two out of five because it's an important work in anthropology and it deserves your critical lens and, you know, an, a perspective on. But as far as ethnographies go, I would not say, this is not a great example of an ethnography or how you should do it. Um, it, it just, it leaves so much wanting. It Sure, was I enthralled with Fernanda as like this feisty, fiery, you know, 40 year old grandma potentially soon to be great grandmother before she even turns 50 yeah i thought she was you know a fascinating person um and her life story was really intriguing but you know does that make for proper ethical uh ethnography i i don't think so from this book so it's definitely worth understanding in its historical context but i mean beyond that, I wouldn't necessarily say you need to read this 600 page ethnography. It's just, it's, it's too much. I think, um, re go read Ferdinandus, Fernanda's story, uh, and, and maybe read the, the methodology section, but I would say you don't need to get to the end. The only person who I was hoping to have redemption for was Simplicio, the only son in the family, because literally everyone just had, like, everyone was out to get each other. Everyone said like, oh, they're always mooching off of me. They're always demanding. Um, but they always seem to say something nice about Simplicio. And then when I got to Simplicio, it was sort of like Simplicio wasn't any better or any worse. He, you know, people had their gripes about him too. It's just, there were fewer of them. So I thought he was going to be the beacon of light, but it, it didn't really feel that way when reading it. Um, it, it just painted everyone as like this cast of complainers all the time, because all that, all that was presented was that they complain all the time, which I question you know like i said the validity of how the data was collected and whether or not this is an accurate reflection of their daily lives or if this is intentionally trying to make people 
uncomfortable to shine a light on poverty and the conditions of poverty, which is sort of the counter argument I've seen and other anthropologists like, well, it really sh shines a light on the conditions of poverty and what leads people to prostitution. But it's definitely a case of like, you know, LBJ, you know, 1960s legislators there. If they read this, they're just like, oh, yeah, like, you know, they brought it on themselves. They only have themselves to blame. Culture of poverty makes sense to me. You know, blame the victim ideology like this. This is going to fit that mentality perfectly without giving a critical lens to it. So I think it's dangerous in that respect. Um, but obviously, I had one opinion about it. Um, I'm going to read a few five-star reviews so that you can get a perspective on some people who really liked it. So I've pulled up some reviews from Goodreads and from Amazon. I'm going to start with Amazon. Uh, so you can see uh, La Vida has a 4.4 out of 5. Um, you know, 71% of reviews are five star and only 6% of them are one star. 7% are two star. And I think <laughs> after reading all the five star reviews, I'm, I can really see, once again, my issues with it are reflected in these sort of five star reviews because it's written in a way that's sort of, it feels like a novel. It feels like it just makes sense. But if you're reading it like it's fiction, but you know, it's technically not fiction, then it can lead to some really slippery slopes of racial and class ideologies. So I'm going to read you Judith's uh, five-star review from 2006. I loved the honesty of this book. Now, this one's a bit lengthy, but I think it kind of encapsulates some of the issues I had with it. The characters did not really have to go have to be Puerto Rican because no matter what your nationality is, you can relate to what every character was going through. I did visit Puerto Rico once, and I did not know there were African-American Puerto Ricans uh, because all I ever saw were the straight hair and light skinned people who did not even talk to African-Americans. Although technically speaking, I'm not sure if that's the term you would use for people in Puerto Rico. But anyway, uh, I went to Puerto Rico on the advice of a Puerto Rican college professor who was teaching me advanced Spanish. I had not read this book before going, but the people were very nice to me and I have no complaints with the people on the island. They loved me and I loved them. Once I read La Vida, I understood the racism towards darker people and kinky hair. Yeah, not great, but okay. Um, reading the review as is, it should not be, but the ones I met are like that. Or the ones I meet are like that. I noticed that sexually, color meant nothing to those who wanted, wanted the thrill. The sex scenes were very explicit. The women and men in La Vida did what they had to do to survive. I am blessed that I never had to go into prostitution, have a drug habit, or cut a person when angry. I must say that I met, did meet professor, professional people born in Puerto Rico who were very nice and loving to me because I speak Spanish as a second language. I could not relate to the dire poverty in the book, but I was blessed that I was a, allowed to see how they had to deal with husbands, boyfriends, neighbors, and other relatives. The book took me away, like Calgon, which I think dates them as probably a boomer, because uh, I think Calgon is like a 1970s or 1980s advertisement. I, I can't remember. I think it's a detergent. Um, but I did return knowing that this is about one family and all the people of Puerto Rico are not like this family. I have met wonderful families and I thank God. I did, the, I did love the Spanglish words that I picked up and the foods. So in her review where she gives it five stars, she admits uh, this does not represent all the people of Puerto Rico. And so you're admitting that like this is just one aspect and they specifically focused in on um, just the Rios family. But yet they're, they're saying uh, you do not have to be Puerto Rican. Uh, you can relate to what every character was going through. So I again, I think there's a danger in sort of creating this fiction like narrative or this this no novel like narrative in um, you know, writing an ethnography this way. There were a couple of other reviews on Amazon that were like that as well, where they said, um, just remember that this doesn't represent uh, everyone. Uh, and this does not represent uh, typical Puerto Rican families. And that's mainly the critique that I saw from people who were, um, you know, Hispanic was they said, this is not an accurate depiction of what it's like. Um, also keep in mind, it's 50 years old. So People shouldn't be reading a 1966 ethnography and thinking, oh, well, this is what it's like. If I go to San Juan, I'm going to see people like this. That's not the case at all. Now, let's look at some reviews from Goodreads. Um, Hello, are you teaching anthropology? Asks Mr. Uh, Chaud 
Hari. Uh, yes, I do teach anthropology. So I teach, currently I'm teaching five classes as of the recording of this podcast. Um, two of them, or no, sorry, three of them are Introduction to Cultural Anthropology. Um, at the beginning of the podcast, I was talking about um, how, you know, the textbook I use actually refers to the book we're talking about today, La Vida. So yeah, I do teach anthropology. And so it it's not surprising that a lot of the books I talk about on this podcast are anthropology books, whether they're ethnographies or archaeology books. Um, but I do own other books that I will be reviewing on the podcast that aren't anthropology based, uh, although vast majority of them will be shocker anthropology. So uh, I wanted to read this review by Ida or Ada, A-I-D-A, uh, reviewed uh, in 2012 because uh, she gave it a five star review. But I feel like she was along the same lines as me in my opinion of the book. Uh, Ada says, it's basically accurate to what percentage? How do I know what they are saying is all truth? The author was awesome and I got to meet him when I was younger. I did read the book by accident one day and took it to Spain to finish. It was unbelievable. Yet when I read things in this book, it was matter of fact on a lot of things. Uh, and there are other reviews like... Um, <laughs> I could read this really lengthy one by Barry, but I'm, I'm not going to. There are other reviews that also talk about, you know, this does not reflect uh, all Puerto Rico. This reflects just one family and how we should remember that. And I think that kind of sums it up, in my opinion. If you are, if you are reading this book and you're writing a five-star review and you have to put in your five-star review, remember, this is not representative of everyone in San Juan or Puerto Rico. When you have to preface by saying, you know, the, if you might have racial ideologies and racial stereotypes that you apply and justify by reading this book, then it's probably not a great ethnography to, to recommend to people. Because if you're the kind of person who might lean a little right or conservative and already have racial ideologies, not to say that everyone who is conservative has racial ideologies associated with them, to be clear, but if you are the type of person who might, you know, watch Fox News or have those sort of leanings or are, you know, someone in that camp, this book is just going to reinforce and double down those kinds of racial ideologies. So that's, that's why I couldn't in good conscience really give this more than a two out of five. And, oh, sorry, I forgot to also mention on Goodreads, it has a hundred ratings, 14 written reviews, and has a 4.03 out of five. So again, it, it's, people really seem to like this book, but I think, as someone who actually teaches anthropology, I just cannot recommend this book. It's a two out of five for me. It's highly questionable from its methods and um, doesn't give credit where credit's due. I mean, that's why, you know, if you want to read this book yourself, it's going in the book bin and, uh, you know, you can claim it and ask for the copy of it that I have. But if you get my copy, it'll say by Carl Lewis and uh, Rosita Gonzalez because she's the one who did all of the actual, you know, heavy lifting for this book. Um, so that's going to do it for this episode and this review. And de definitely check out the um, Google sheet that I've created that lists all the books that I've reviewed, has the ratings on there, uh, has their status. So some of the books, uh, as I've said before, if it's can it or keep it, shelve it or shove it, um, some books end up saving the art or salvaging the artwork. Other books, I feel like, you know, if they're not going to get recycled or thrown in the trash, then I offer them up to listeners who want to read the book. Um, and you can go claim them uh, by sending an email to anthropologyarchives at gmail.com. If you have questions, comments, um, or, quest or questions or comments, say it five times, I guess. Um, or you'd like to ask for a copy of the book, you can email me and I'm willing to mail it to you. Um, so that's something else to consider. La Vida is definitely going in the book bin. I am not going to keep this book. Um, I got all I could get out of it, and I'm willing to share it with someone else who wants to read it with a critical lens, critical eye, I should say. Um, but that's uh, that's my thoughts on uh, La Vida. The oh, I guess I should read you the full title, right? La Vida, A Puerto Rican Family in the Culture of Poverty, San Juan in New York by Oscar Lewis and Rosita Gonzalez. Um and I'm sure some people will say, well, what about, you know, Douglas Butterworth and all the other people that he gives in the acknowledgments? Well, I didn't see them saying Doug every time I read a chapter of this book. 
pretty much every chapter has a mention of what Rosa was doing in the room because Rosa was the one who was visiting the Rios family day in and day out. Um, so she was the one who actually did the field work in the ethnography, not Oscar Lewis. He just synthesized it. Um, next week is a pre-recorded podcast. So um, unfortunately it will not be live, but I will be um, premiering it uh, at our usual time, 11 a.m. Eastern on Thursday. And it is a our first episode with a guest host. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. It's also one of our first forays into fiction. I don't think I've talked about a fiction book yet, actually. I'm just piecing that together. We haven't talked about fiction yet. So we'll be talking about a fiction, a couple of fiction books next week, Jet Set and uh, Don't Judge a Girl by Her Cover, uh, some young adult fiction uh, about teenage girls. <laughs> so that'll be interesting. And until then, never stop reading.